The next speaker is Metropolitan Jonah. He is the rector of St. Herman of Alaska Orthodox Church in Stafford, Virginia, and is an abbot of St. Demetrios of Thessaloniki Monastery in Spotsylvania, Virginia. His eminence also serves the Holy Archangels Orthodox Foundation. In 2008, he became the first Orthodox convert to be elected as primate of the Orthodox Church in America. And since 2015, Vladika has been a bishop in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Please welcome Metropolitan Jonah. God bless you. It's a joy to be here with you all. What I'd like to talk about today, first off, a little uh, socio-political commentary, but then the real question is, how do we evangelize? And how do we establish the Orthodox community in the South? And I think this is something that we need to consider as a single community of Orthodox Christians. We've got all these different jurisdictions, which are really, we make so much of jurisdiction. And quite frankly, jurisdiction has nothing to do with lay people. It has to do with who puts the antimins on the altar and who assigns the priest, okay? We're one Orthodox community. Brokor, OCA, Antiochian, Greek, Serbian, you name it, Bulgarian. And we need to work together. And this is why a meeting like this is so important. Because we have people from all these different jurisdictions, I assume, right? Um, scattered from, uh, from across the South. In some places, that, that unity is, is rather imperiled. But in some places, and in many places, that unity remains very strong despite those factors that would be imposed on us because of things that are going on across the sea. I think we need to emphasize in our, in our churches, in our minds, in our hearts, that we're one community. As Orthodox Christians, one of the most important aspects of Orthodoxy is that it's a fully integrated way of life. You don't have religion over here and politics over here, family over here and community over here, and then those things which you can't take outside of Las Vegas, right? <laughs> it's all a single whole. And this is what, comp what comprises a traditional society. As Orthodox Christians, what we're trying to do ultimately in our parishes and what we are doing in our parishes is that we are recreating traditional society. And it's probably the most countercultural thing um, that, uh, that exists in America. You have the, you know, you have all these various subcultures and all of these, all of these things, but they all kind of go along uh, with those who would be cultural leaders coming out of New York, L.A., and, uh, and other places in the far north. Um, whose ideology is very different. Whose ideology is radically secularized, which means compartmentalized. But it's also an ideology that is formed and 
has as its great ideals Marxism, socialism. Socialism is not only the radical secularization of society by its compartmentalization. It's based on hatred. It's based on the hatred of God, the hatred of everything that has to do with God, religion, church, uh, art, music, all these things. In other words, the hatred of what is beautiful. It's based on the hatred of family. And thus it's the polar opposite of Christianity, which is based on love. And so in any way, shape, or form in which we let hatred come into our lives, any way, shape, or form of any one we have given ourselves over to the other side and deny Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of love of neighbor. And it's, and it's this which distinguishes us as Orthodox Christians, if we indeed take up the challenge to live it. It's very easy to be doctrinally correct it's very easy to be liturgically correct. Um, it, may be, it may be easy to be correct as to the application of discipline. You know, um, you, can, you can have all the externals all correct and criticize and tear apart and, and hate, if not by emotion, if at least by action. Those who don't conform to your own uh, little personal standard of orthodoxy. And what happens when we do this is we give ourselves over to the other side. We have to really look and see what are we doing and how we are doing it. Um, a couple months ago, uh, our Metropolitan Nicholas uh, called me up, and he was very concerned about the quality of the, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it dialogue, the quali quality of the discourse um, of internet orthodoxy, cyberdoxy, as I call it. Um, I'd like to make a, dis as a, a distinction here between cyberdoxy and internet orthodoxy. There's some incredibly valuable things on the internet um, for, uh, for the orthodox faith, um, including social criticism um, when it's done right. But what, what, I, what I refer to as cyberdoxy is when you have all of these catechumen theologians who are getting up and pontificating on the highest mysteries of the faith um, and then arguing about them uh, in, pro in absolutely vulgar terms and using, you know, using language that's utterly and improper for Orthodox Christians, much less for discourse about theology, much less for discourse about the highest mysteries of the faith which they don't have and would not and would never have would well I won't say never um, which they would not have for at least another 30 years essences and energies which can things like this can which only be perceived noetically the first step to being able to perceive something noetically is purification of soul is dispassion. <laughs> That's so before you know. So 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 a lot of this um, this discourse and young men, of course, love to argue, right? But it needs to be about things that are really helpful, and not about some uh, academic intellectualist reduction 
of the, of the most profound mysteries. But rather, I think what we need to do is we need to turn our, our uh, creativity. We need to turn our imagination. We need to turn our, our energy and our effort as to understand in a, in a completely constructive way, how do we spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what orthodoxy is. It's an entirely integrated vision. How our theology, our liturgy, our religious practice, how we live in our families, how we conduct our business, how we conduct ourselves in public, um, it's all integrated. And ultimately, you know, monarchy was mentioned, I think, I have no, I have no ex expectation there would be any kind of monarchy in this country. Um, restoration of the czar, yes. <laughs> um, but not yet. <laughs> because what has to be overcome first, and incidentally, this is what is happening in Russia, is the reintegration and the healing of the society by restoring Orthodox Christianity as the fundamental integrating factor which holds it all together. Marxism, socialism is not integrating. In fact, it atomizes, it's destructive. It's destructive on multiple levels. Not only does it want to destroy family, not only does it want to destroy uh, the churches, it wants to destroy society in general, because it reduces persons to simply autonomous individuals. You want, the, you want the real end of individualism? It's Marxism. You're either a producer and a consumer, and every other factor is irrelevant. And of course, when you can no, no longer either produce or consume, what is there? Soil and green, right? <laughs> this is very serious. And this is not just about the history of the Soviet Union. This is the ruling ideology now in our country. This is the ruling idea, ideology of the current regime in Washington. And this is certainly the current ideology of the ruling of the globalists, internationalists. You know, 100 years ago, they called them internationalists. Now we call them globalists. Same, <laughs> the same ideology. You know. And what it does is it only recreates the dichotomy between the oppressors and the oppressed. So instead of, you know, whites oppressing blacks and capitalists oppressing uh, the proletariat and on and on and on and on and all of those dichotomies, you get the elites oppressing everyone. <laughs> You'll own nothing and be happy. This is Trotskyism. The neoconservatives are Trotskyites. Just follow their history. We have to stand up against this. I, am not, I, don't, I don't think that standing up against it in violent revolution is going to 
is going to do it. At least, it's not something that is likely to produce much fruit right now. But what we have to do is, as Rod Dreher quoted, we have to live not by lies. We have to live according to that which we know to be true. Of course, in socialism, there is no truth. For us, Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And he has to be at the absolute focus of every aspect of our life. And he and the faith, faith in him, the faith of Christ that he preached, faith in the Holy Trinity is the integrating factor for the totality of our life. Now, we heard some really wonderful um, historical and, and social philosophical elements of, of what differentiates the South and the uniqueness of its culture. And it's precisely because of this, this, this remembrance of a traditional society, this sacramental vision of life, which is, as Dr. Livingston said, quoting, I don't remember who, um, that there is a sacramental vision of life, but not a sacramental religion. We can supply the sacramental religion because that sacramental vision of life in which everything, everything is a sacrament of the presence of God. Everything and everyone, every human being made in the image of God, every human being bears the dignity of that image and is of infinite value from the moment of conception to the moment of their natural death. This is so important for us as Orthodox Christians because we have at the very heart, the very, as our very heart, that noetic quality of our soul, which is immutable and which Cannot, cannot be changed, cannot be damaged, cannot be hurt, cannot be destroyed, and is perfect and beautiful. No matter how distorted somebody might become, no matter how sinful somebody might become, no matter how uh, broken, no matter how uh, retarded, no matter how, no matter what, at the, and no matter how brutally somebody had been abused and used, at the heart, at the core of their being is this, is this, this noetic quality, which is pure and beautiful and holy. In other words, we totally reject dep uh, total depravity. <laughs> um, this has incredible incredible uh, uh, consequences for how do we understand our society and how do we approach people? How do we approach people to bring them into the church? We have to approach them with respect. We have to approach them with respect for their faith. Whether we agree with the doctrines of their of their denomination or what, it doesn't matter. If they've come to faith, how many here came to faith before they ever heard of orthodoxy? Yeah. As Father John quoted, you know, um, 
uh, Peter Gilquist. Well, if the Holy Spirit doesn't work outside the church, how did I get here? We're here because of the work of the Holy Spirit outside the church, outside the canonical bounds of the church. There's a wonderful story in uh, the book St. Silouan by St. Sophroni, um, where St. Silouan um, was standing with a group of monks listening to some hotshot young Archimandrite who was, an, who was a missionary, probably in a Catholic country from, the quality, from what, what it said in the uh, dialogue. And uh, the missionary was telling him, yeah, I'm really giving it to them. I'm telling them they're all going to go to hell unless they convert to orthodoxy and everything they've been taught is wrong and, and on and on and on and on. And, and St. Silouan said, wait a minute. Do they believe in God? Yes. Do they believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Do they believe in the Holy Trinity? Yes. Do they read the Bible? Yes. Do they have the sacraments? Yes. Do they venerate the Mother of God? Yes. So he said, well, if you go and you tell them that everything that they have believed uh, is a lie, and that every and uh, that everything up until until now is wrong, they will know that you're a liar, and they will reject you, which is which they should, which they should. We have to respect the faith of people, and we, as, just as we have to respect people. This, I believe, is a strong Southern value. Respect and dignity and honor. These values are gone in the, in the socialist North, in the urban North which extends to the urban areas of the South as well, uh, in many places. Honor, respect, responsibility. You don't need those in a Marxist utopia. Of course, a Marxist utopia certainly doesn't exist. Look at the streets of LA, San Francisco, New York, and there's your Marxist utopia for you. These values that we hold, these values which were at the core of, um, of American society, not just in the South, but I believe uh, in the West, in the Midwest, Northeast, eh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> um, the real Yankees. Um, We value them because they make our lives fulfilled. They bring us joy. They bring us happiness. Have you ever seen a happy blue-haired lesbian? <laughs> or a... Uh, or, or a happy Antifa member? No, it's anger, it's hatred, and it's, and it's based on envy. In other words, it's evil. And our, but these people are not our enemies. Those people who are acting out like that are crying out for help. They're crying out in pain. They're crying out because they need to be loved. And what they envy is people who come from solid families who grew up knowing that they were loved. 
because that's the foundation for a healthy personality. Family is so critically important, and it's a fundamental orthodox value. How many of you have, have studied the wedding service? What does it talk about? <laughs> Having many children. <laughs> many, many, many children. As many as God gives. It's not just about marriage. Marriage is certainly not about the wedding service. Wedding service is there to consecrate the marriage. It's not the goal of the marriage. And it's certainly not the reception. The mar marriage is about that commitment to one another, which is a commitment and a relationship between families, between clans. We don't use this language so much. Still did when I was a kid. But it's a, rela it's a relationship that is, that is wrought between families and consecrated sacramentally by the church. As an, not only an alliance, usually it also has economic Im implications. People help each other out. People help support one another. Their families, whether they're in laws or natural family. And family includes not only mom and dad and the kids, but it's grandma, grandpa, great grandma, great grandpa, um, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, right? My guess is probably in the South is that uh, that system still remains to some degree. When I was a kid, um, and I grew up in, I was born and grew up in Chicago as a, until I was eight. Um, we would go up to uh, my grandmother's house in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, all of the nine brothers and sisters of my father um, and their husbands, wives, and children, all my cousins, would all get together at grandma's house for dinner every Sunday every Sunday. Of course, that ended once my grandmother died, but they still get together. And she died 40 years ago. They still love one another, even though all my aunts and uncles, natural aunts and uncles are gone. And there's a network of cousins, most of whom I wouldn't recognize on the street because I haven't seen them in 40, 50 years. But the importance of family is something, if you look at the history of Orthodox society, the importance of family is something critical. And the reality is we've got vast amounts of canon law like regulating and talking about marriage, you know, and what, what does it mean that you, that you can't marry someone within six uh, levels of relationship? That's like, what, a fourth cousin or something like that? Maybe you can marry? Third cousin? Third cousin. So there's something very important there. And it's, and it's these family relationships between clans that are what create society. Society is not just a, uh, a group of individuals who agree to come together. It's a community. One of the, is orthodoxy essentially values community. What is a Protestant church? A lot of Protestant churches, and especially the evangelicals because Protestantism is dead, um, 
uh, are simply a bunch of autonomous individuals coming together um, who may or may not get to know one another, or may they, they may get to know little groups of people within, within a vast congregation of some secret church. But there's no stability there. Evangelicals stay in, in those secret churches, those big churches, for no more than three years, usually. Whereas orthodoxy, you commit to orthodoxy, it's a lifetime commitment. It's a lifetime commitment. And it's a commitment that you hope to pass on to your progeny from generation to generation to generation. This is how we build an orthodox society. Work is another incredibly important thing. I had a, the monastery I had in, I, I was abbot of in, uh, in California. We would have, uh, we would have people come up. Um, we were 250 miles north of the Bay Area, so people would, you know, it was it was quite a trek to come up, um, and uh, and they would work around the monastery, and and they loved to do it. And they, said, and they all said, it gave us an entirely different perspective on the meaning of work. A monastery is basically a microcosm of the church with certain disciplines. It's trying to live, the, live out the gospel purely, pure and simple. That's what monasticism is. And in that context, work is an essential aspect. But it's sanctified. And it's a means of sanctification, no matter what it is. Uh, for us, it was, uh, we would have the guests do things like where they couldn't create too many problems. Um, <laughs> uh, like chopping down trees, tilling the garden, um, uh, chopping wood, doing, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was, a, it was an offering of love. But, and, but do you realize also that your work in the world, that going, going to the office or going to, uh, to the to the shop or whatever it is, going to work, is an offering of love to your family. Where you sacrifice yourself, you sacrifice your time, and you certainly have to sacrifice your income to support your family for their good as an act of love. That's sanctified. That work is holy, and it's of incredible value. Maybe, maybe the drudgery of being a housewife and taking, taking care of the kids, you know, where you don't have any time to talk to another adult, you know, um, which can be very difficult, but it's an act of love. And actually, that's probably one of the most critical and important ministries a woman can have. It's so important that mama be with her children from the time they're born and not put them in daycare not be an absentee. If, if there is a vocation for, for women, it's to be a mother. And it's a holy vocation. Just look at the Theotokos. It's a holy vocation that sanctifies. Some of the, re, uh, some of the research I've been doing, because my the main thing that I have to be concerned with as an abbot and as a pastor is how to bring healing 
to all of these broken young men that come. And one of the things that I have found, um, both through hearing confessions as well as through the literature, is probably one of the most damaging things in our society is daycare. What happens when you take a, an infant, 40, you know, eight weeks old, to daycare? Well, the kid screams bloody murder until they can't scream anymore. Because all they know is mama has abandoned me. I must not be worth anything. I must be a piece of garbage to be thrown out. I'm nothing. Nobody loves, no, nobody loves me. Who are these strangers? I, they don't love me. And we wonder why there's so much mental illness. Please, I entreat you, do not put your kids in daycare. It's a financial sacrifice. But for how many moms who are working, all they make is enough to put the kid in daycare. Right? Not much else. It's so, so in important. Not only for the, uh, for the emotional stability of those kids, but for their very souls. Because those who emerge from that, and 40% of the kids who go into daycare are damaged, according to studies both in the United States, Canada, as, uh, and as well as in Europe, 40%, with um, symptoms that last through their 20s and maybe beyond, is it leaves them with a, with a personal foundation of self-hatred and self-loathing, of rejection and isolation. So, we have a lot of work to do. And ladies, your, your work in this is incredibly important because there is nothing that can, that can substitute for a mother's love and care. I can't really say that it's a, um, a gospel value, but I think we can, we can say to some degree that liberty is not something that is alien to the gospel. We just heard in the gospel reading the other day for the church new year, I've come, come to proclaim uh, sight to the blind, liberty for the captives. But it's something we certainly value as Americans. But that's not a liberty of do whatever you feel like. It's a liberty that has as its fundamental qualifier responsibility. Responsibility for your family. Responsibility for yourself. Responsibility for your community. Responsibility for your church. Real adulthood, real maturity, is all about taking responsibility. I'm, I'm unfortunately know lots of 30, 40, and 50-year-old boys who don't take responsibility for anything. And of course, with uh, minimum guaranteed income, you don't have to take responsibility for anything, right? You can go into any big city in, uh, in this country and you can walk off with $1,000 worth of stuff without, without paying. It's called stealing, but as Solzhenitsyn said, if God does not exist, you can do anything. So for those for whom God does not exist, as they live in that delusion, 
There's no responsibility for anything. It's our, it's our common culture as traditional Christians that we take responsibility for our lives and we take responsibility, as, especially as men, for the lives of those around us and as women for the lives of our, of our family and children. All of these values, faith, family, liberty, work, and honor, are essential values for Orthodox Christians. And it's on the basis of these that we can, uh, that we can build a traditional society which produces healthy people. Because really, that's what, that's what all these traditional values do. They produce healthy people. People that, that can relate to one another, that love one another, that, um, that take responsibility for, uh, for one another, to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to assist one another when necessary. who have their eyes focused on God and on the faith and on Jesus Christ. And this also, I think, is what is so lacking in our contemporary society, which is not producing happy, healthy people, right? Our contemporary society is producing atomized, isolated, um, autonomous, autocephalous individuals <laughs> with no accountability and no responsibility and, and, um, and, and basically who live lives of great uh, anger, bitterness, and frustration. because they have nothing more than work and going to the mall, or, or rather browsing on Amazon, to, grat to gratify them. Oh, there's plenty of gratification, all right. But all it is is self-gratification. Everything in life becomes self-gratification. We have, to stay, we have to say, no, there's a better way. And if we can model that, if we can model a life according to the gospel in which we love our neighbors, in which we love our enemies, because the real uh, criterion of being a Christian, according to Father Sophroni, Saint Sophroni. It's where the rubber meets the road, is not how you love your friends and your family, not, those, not how you love your, your co-religionists and members of your church, and especially your jurisdiction or whatever. It's how, how you love your enemies. I love that quote from St. Saint, uh, Sophroni. The degree to which you love the person that you despise the most is the degree to which you love God. Our task is to cast out all anger, bitterness, hatred, resentment, towards others and to show them and to manifest the love of God for them. We don't need to argue with them. Doctrine is, is, is actually sec very secondary. I say this is with degrees in dogmatics. <laughs> Doctrine is secondary. And St. Paul tells us not to argue about it, right? What we, need, what, we need to, what we need to argue about is what's the best way 
to make this a reality? How can, how can we repent and change our behavior and change our minds and our hearts so that, so that we cast out all of that darkness and become transparent to the light of God? Then, if we can do that, then people will want to come to our churches. They will be filled with, because, and because we are filled with joy, that joy is contagious. When we are filled with the love of God, that love is contagious. God loves his entire creation. God loves everyone who is in his image and likeness especially. Not just the Orthodox. We have to realize and actualize that through our life, through our ministry, through the words that we speak, through how we treat those who come to us, and, for, and how we treat those that we reach out to, whether in charity, in compassion, or in friendship. So, brothers and sisters, we have a lot of work to do. So. Uh, may God bless you and uh, ask your prayers. Thank you.